Hello, everyone. Welcome to the October edition of HeartTalks.org, um, also known as uh, Controversies in Cardiology, the Ananda Sharma uh, Lectureship and Professorship um, here at Mount Sinai. I'll tell you a little bit about the coming attractions. We have uh, Dr. Andrew Marks from Columbia in November, November 11th. December 16th, William Stevenson from Brigham and Women's. January 13th, Tony DeMaria. February 10th, Andrew Epstein from Penn. March 17th, Joe Liscalzo from Brigham and Women's. April 7th, Ken Ellenbogen um, from Virginia. In May, David Holmes from Mayo Clinic. And June 16th, Chris O'Connor from Duke. One of the uh, um, most important things that make this program a success is the professors that we invite. We've gotten tremendous feedback that though the day is very, very busy, that they spend half the day with our fellows, uh, and then they go through the questioning here during our moderated panel discussion. It's very important that I get feedback from our current fellows, past fellows, about additional people that they would like invited. So there's a form out front. If people can let me know who potential candidates are for future visiting professorships, that's very important uh, for our success in the program. Uh, we're actually privileged today to have um, Dr. Spencer King, and Dr. Fuster will introduce him. Dr. Fuster, who usually moderates this panel, is the incoming editor of Jack. Dr. Spencer King is the current editor of Jack Intervention, and Dr. Narula, who couldn't be here today, is editor of Jack Imaging. So we have most of Journal of American College of Cardiology and the subsidiary uh, journals uh, here uh, in force today at Mount Sinai. What I uh, want you to do is give your attention uh, to Ari Pollock, who spent uh, a tremendous amount of time putting together today's topic. Uh, which is very controversial and very hot, uh, preventative stenting and uh, preventative coronary stenting in acute MI. Uh, the moderator today is going to be Dr. Simin Sharma. Huh? Hi, how are you? My name is Ari. I'm one of the first year cardiology fellows, and it's uh, my privilege to introduce the topic today. The timely treatment of the culprit lesion in patients with acute ST segment elevation MI is essential to minimizing myocardial necrosis, curbing recurrent ischemia, and reducing mortality. Our experience over the years has established PCI as the gold standard for prompt restoration of coronary blood flow in the acute setting. STEMI patients, however, with multivessel coronary artery disease have higher mortality rates, higher incidence of recurrent myocardial infarction than patients with single vessel coronary disease. And the presence of triple vessel coronary disease a diagnosed during an acute MI portends a worse prognosis. While it can be assumed that the extent of coronary disease has a direct impact on outcomes in patients who present with STEMI, practice guidelines unequivocally support culprit vessel intervention alone in the acute setting. This is despite the fact that many patients with STEMI possess obstructive multivessel coronary disease. Emerging literature, however, questions this practice, and the climate changes we regularly witness in cardiology suggest that this contentious area may not be immune to change. As mentioned during emergency angiography, immediate intervention on the thr thrombotic lesion remained the primary focus. After successful PCI of the culprit lesion, several competing strategies are available for STEMI patients who possess additional obstructive plaques, immediate coronary stenting, staged PCI, or medical therapy and prevention. So I ask, why do competing strategies exist when the ACC and the AHA, AHA practice guidelines concerning multivessel PCI during STEMI clearly and prohibitively state that PCI should not be performed in a non-infarct artery at the time of primary PCI, PCI in patients without hemodynamic uh, compromise? Level, uh, the recommendation is a class, class three recommendation. Is it because of the supportive literature from which we extrapolate these guidelines is suspect? Alternatively, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines offers a more liberal stance, giving a class 2A recommendation uh, in, uh, with regards to PCI in this setting. And this allows for some flexibility in terms of management and practice appropriateness. 
I believe it is the advances in interventional capabilities and technologies, uh, increasing operator experience and improved pharmacologic therapies uh, which have made PCI safer and effective in these high risk circumstances. This may have opened the door to safely revisiting this clinical dilemma with which many cardiologists face. Be that as it may, the debate regarding the appropriate strategy continues, especially in light of the preventive angioplasty in acute myocardial infarction, or PRAMI study, in which Wald and his uh, group of investigators questioned the immediate natural history of non-culprate obstructive coronary disease in the midst of STEMI, as well as the value of performing preventative PCI in such arteries. In contrast to the current STEMI management guidelines and the studies which prompted these recommendations, the PRAMI investigators demonstrated that in patients under going primary PCI for STEMI, the outcomes of cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and refractory angina were significantly reduced in the preventative PCI group as compared with contemporary optimal medical therapy. Naturally, this investigation has raised a variety of intriguing questions. What are the pathophysiologic principles at play during a STEMI and how do they impact non-culprit plaque? How does targeting such mechanisms via PCI offer a clinical benefit and how might this change the natural history of non-culprit obstructive disease in the immediate aftermath of an acute coronary syndrome? Why are these findings in primary so contrary to what we already know? Additionally, if multivessel PCI, excuse me, coronary disease is present during a STEMI and an aggressive strategy is preferred, does the timing of the subsequent PCI make a difference? Practice guidelines have cautioned against treating multiple vessels during a STEMI, especially in patients without hemodynamic compromise. The gu these guidelines, in part, originate from safety concerns related to multivessel intervention, as well as the idea that PCI of non-culprit lesions may not improve mortality. Trials examining the concept of preventative stenting in patients with stable coronary disease identified on angiography have repeatedly shown that PCI does not prevent myocardial infarction and death. However, it may be that the pathophysiologic milieu of an acute STEMI alters the behavior of non-infarct lesions, rendering intervention beneficial. It also uh, may be that a reduction in total ischemia, residual ischemia, improved pump, fun pump function in non-infarct territory may again render intervention beneficial. The what we do know is that the contemporary literature as it relates to this clinical context is largely indirect in its investigation, retrospective in its analysis, and contradictory in terms of its findings. I think that the PRAMI trial questions, and, uh, questions the current practice guidelines and obligates us to at least re-examine the existing position adopted by the major cardiac societies as it relates to the topic of preventative PCI in myocardial infarction. Thank you. Thanks, Ari, very much <clears throat> for your presentation. This is a, an interesting topic that will be addressed in a few minutes. And I have the great opportunity to introduce the discussion uh, of, uh, of this uh, evening, uh, Dr. Spencer King. Everybody knows him. I just like to say a few, to make a few comments. First of all, uh, Dr. King was born in Charleston, in South Carolina, and he attended medical college, or he obtained a medical degree at the Medical College of Georgia. And then he went to Emory, where he had his internship in, uh, in medicine, and then the fellowship in cardiology. Then he moved for a year to the University of Colorado Medical Center, and then soon, moved back to Emory, where from assistant professor, he moved uh, towards a professor of medicine uh, in the year 2000. When he joined Emory, uh, very soon after the fellowship, he became the director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory at Emory. And he's very well known because he's the one who recruited Andreas Grunsik to come to this country something that uh, people thought was almost impossible, but I don't know, he got the visa, he got everything, and Spencer was the real driving force for such a, an outstanding recruitment. Uh, eventually, he became co-director of the American Cardiovascular Research Institute there in Atlanta. He worked uh, 
a few years at Piedmont Hospital there in Atlanta, and at the present time, he's the president and vice chairman of the board of directors of the St. Joseph Heart and Vascular Institute uh, in Atlanta. Now, it's difficult to go over everything he has done, but I will try to summarize by saying, in terms of um, positions, he has been president of the American College of Cardiology, chairman of the American Board of Internal Medicine for Intervention. He has been chair of Education and Training Committee for the World Heart Federation. At NHLBI, he has been in the study section of clinical trials. He has been... Uh, was the principal investigator and the chairman of a very critical trial on angioplasty. This is where all it started, which was the Emory angioplasty uh, versus surgery trial. Uh, chairman of the Bethesda Conference at the American College of Cardiology, Society of Cardiac Angiography Chairman, Interventional Cardiology. And I can go on and on, but the thing is, is worth mentioning that he has been in the steering committee of actually, I had the chance to count it, of 30 MESHA trials. So he has been certainly a driving force in the, particularly in interventional cardiology. Now, in terms of editorial boards, he's in all the editorial boards of any cardiovascular journal that has a good impact factor, he's there, and certainly he's the editor-in-chief of Jack uh, Cardiovascular Intervention. Now, um, in terms of awards, he got an award everywhere he has been, from college, internship, residency, fellowship. Then he got an uh, Osler Award, Legend of the Millennium Award from Florida Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. And he has given the Mesha lectures, bishop lecture, and so forth, of all the societies. Um, Spencer, which is the most important, is a very well-published individual, uh, has more than 500 papers. And he really has touched on every aspect that, uh, of the field of coronary, of coronary artery disease, vascular disease, and many others. So it is a pleasure, Spencer, to have you here today. You don't need a lot of introduction. Everybody knows you. And uh, thanks for coming. I'd like to give you a plaque to remember such occasion. And uh, so after a number of things says is given to you for outstanding teaching, wisdom, and expertise, and the Anandi Sharma visiting professor and Simon Dack memorial lecture. You remember Simon very well. Sure. Good. Yeah. Well, anyway, this is for you, and congratulations. This is a check. It doesn't look too thick. <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming and for spending time with the fellows today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now we have a, a group of panelists. Dr. Sharma, I mean, Sharma will be the moderator. I thought it was much more appropriate than me talking about the stents. Uh, Zahi Fayad, Dr. Kini, Pedro Moreno, Javier Sant, and certainly Ari Pollard. Do I miss anybody? <coughs> Roxana, why you don't get the chair there? I think George should go, because he was the first the chair of the expert for that program. The then George, 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 because uh, Dr. Fuster left off the most important uh, part of my biography. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm importantly was on the uh, search committee for the uh, new editor of Jack, uh, and we selected, I think, the best uh, possible editor, Val Fuster. Oh, OK, we 
got the chairs for everyone. Uh, Dr. Fayyad, join Dr. us, Fayyad, please. We got the chair. Yes, the chair here. We have the chair. It's like you bring your own chair. It's like bring your own bottle. Yes. <laughs> we have all set. Everyone? Okay. Nice. Uh, as have been eluded, the, actually the topic from my point of view is very exciting. The one of the reason is that many, many trials have been done for interventional cardiology and most of the time intervention failed, whether it was medical therapy, doing nothing or surgery. But two trials have finally now back to back. One is the FAME-2 trial with the FFR of less than 0.8 against medical therapy, PCI was superior. And the second is this word of the preventive uh, intervention uh, in angioplasty in patients with the stent. So I think before we go into individual point of the trial, uh, knowing the, that Dr. Spencer King with the great knowledge uh, and experience about the subject and so, uh, just to, as you heard earlier, the idea was that patients who have multi-vessel disease, not in shock, because we know that patient in shock gets the PCI of all the possible vessels at that time if, because of the hemodynamic instability. So not only one vessel, you do multi-vessel. But guidelines have prevented us from doing PCI of even a 90% non-culprit lesion because it's an evidence uh, class three indication because associated complication of intervention, fear to uh, cause more complication and bad outcome, and this actually some registry data. So before we go on to individual point and the reason for it and various pathophysiology, and so maybe I'll just ask Dr. Spencer King uh, for maybe two minutes, uh, just make his comments that from his point of view, uh, that what we should understand about the premi and how you interpret the data. Spencer. Two minutes. I don't know if I can do it in two minutes. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I come from the uh, point of view that a reperfusion was good for myocardial infarction, that uh, opening the artery was a good idea. And we, uh, we saw that with uh, thrombolysis, we saw it with uh, uh, angioplasty, then we saw it with stents, and finally drug looting stent added a little bit, not much, to that. But opening that infarct artery was helpful. Now the question that was addressed in this trial, we can get into the details of it, but the uh, uh, main uh, the main message uh, is flawed in one major uh, way. This is a trial of uh, a strategy of opening only the infarct-related artery uh, versus. Uh, uh, opening other arteries, but a very common strategy that was employed uh, in New York, and we published this uh, from the registry of your patients, uh, allowed for a uh, staged procedure. That is, patients judged to have important lesions through whatever mechanism, sometimes uh, judged by perfusion imaging, sometimes judged just by the angiography, but a judgment made that not only the infarct artery, but something else need to be open, that that was done in a staged procedure. The, the prior admonition against doing multiple lesions at the same time was, grew out of the balloon angioplasty era. You gotta remember that you open, you stop the infarction, and then the question is, should you go ahead and do a bunch of other things? Well, in this heightened thrombogenic milieu, you really got in trouble if you did balloon angioplasty. Now, did stents change all that? And that really wasn't investigated until now. But missing from this uh, current trial, we'll talk about it more, was the fact that uh, important other lesions were not allowed to be opened electively in this trial. So just understand, this is a bit artificial, the way this thing is structured compared to what is done in this hospital. Yeah. Um, George? 
definitely. Yeah, this is a great topic. I must say that uh, the, the, the hospital, the, the healthcare system that this study was done indeed uh, discourages to a certain degree or creates long waiting lines for outpatient follow up, both in, in uh, stress testing as well as in, in PCI. I must say at the same time, though, that even guidelines in the United States are discouraging to just. Uh, schedule a stage intervention after a, a, an AMI, and therefore you need again to have a stress test. So we're drifting a little bit down the pathway of creating uh, a lot of delays in this, uh, in this system as well. So I have to take this under account. And the, the key point of, the, of this trial, as actually presented at the European Congress, I had the chance to, uh, to be appointed the official commentator. I have a lot of discussions with the investigator because it's really a puzzling result. It turns out that this was a selected group of patients in the end of the day. They, they, it took them a long time to accrue. And uh, you know, the most important aspect, in my point of view, was what, however they chose that, this incremental PCI took about 15 to 20 minutes. That was incremental time to do the job. So, and it was obviously very important vessel because the, 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 the investigators passed about so many other cases which they didn't even enroll. So somehow they felt that there was another lesion and at the same time this wasn't a, you know, crazy interventional case with, uh, you know, embarking in a rotablator of different stands with bifurcations, uh, et cetera. Something that somehow they felt they could safely perform in a rather speedy fashion. Could, could I ask you what your thought was about the fact that most of these were inferior infarcts, so what was left behind was it? frequently an, uh, an LED, probably with a tight lesion. Exactly. It's something that, you know, if vulnerable in short order or medium, uh, uh, medium time window, it might create a lot of trouble. So somehow they selected a mix between ischemia and vulnerability, at least in the short term, uh, by their, you know, selection criteria of the, of the investigator who put the patients in. But, but in the supplemental, the culprit lesion being LAD or RCA had the same hazard ratio. And the confidence intervals are below the unit. So in the supplemental part of the paper, they analyzed the culprit lesion. I think before we get into the discussion, we have to say that this trial show unequivocally that doing multivessel PCI in acute MI is better than doing the culprit lesion. We should start there. I think the, the, if we do it at the same time or if we do it at stage, that's another question. But the trial is a randomized trial. They selected from 2,400 patients, they selected 500, I mean 450. 450, yeah. So it's not like the, it's not like the, you know, like the uh, other trial that selected from 30,000, 2,000. And it is a randomized trial, and the steering committee stopped the trial early, at 23 months, because they saw that the maze was, the, rel the relative risk reduction was 64%. For death, MI, and repeat uh, and angina, which is you know repeating revascularization. So the death was also 64% reduction, but the confidence intervals goes a little bit at 1.08, and therefore the p-value is like 0 0.067. But it was very close to show reduction in death. So going back to just to put my colleagues in line, I think we can go and discuss. But this is a randomized trial, well designed, that shows that we have to fix these lesions. Which yeah, I think that's a very, very good point to start with. Uh, reason is, that, let's come back to point. What has been shown over the years now? One is decreasing the door to balloon time. Right? The D2 balloon, uh, the whole country, uh, the D2 balloon alliances, uh, the all kind of registries, mission lifeline, and so the all focus has been educate the patients, let them come to the emergency room early. And once they come to the emergency room or being transported, that get decrease that door to balloon time. Although from symptom onset to balloon time, it has been a question because some patients come early and, uh, uh, and get a better outcome versus some people come late. But door to balloon time has been a very big factor uh, by the studies in the past. 
just to precursor to this paper, there is also the recent study from ACC, from CATH PCI registry, showed that we have done a tremendous job of decreasing door to balloon time from median of 93 minutes to now mid 60s. But in last five, six years, the mortality has been flat. Uh, in hospital or 30 day around three to four percent had not changed. So therefore just to have something to make a very important impact is has to be really effective strategy. And so the really effective strategy as mentioned here is you have multivessel disease, even if the 30% were LED or 70% were RCA, that's a different story. But the key is that you have multivessel, you did the PCI, it decreased the event at about two years of follow-up of death, MI, and, uh, and of course the refractory angina. Refractory angina you can understand, but death and MI and both combined were significantly lower. Now coming back to the point, more important is that before this study, and this is where I would ask uh, the opinion here, that before the study, if there are various registry report, as Dr. Spencer King pointed out, we are the author from the New York State, uh, that if you did a PCI at the same time in multi-vessel, you actually had a bad outcome, you had a better outcome if you staged it. But all these, that how do we say that what were the differences in other registry data? Similar data came from Horizons AMI in multi-vessel anytime because in US people don't do the multi-vessel PCI, but in other trials of multinational um, that outside the United States, the PCI of more than one vessel is routinely being done. I can tell you it's being done in India. The biggest factor there is the cost and patients' compliance coming back for the second intervention. So various regions, people do, despite the guidelines in US, the ACC guidelines, to the contrary, but multi-vessel PCIs are being done. So I think the most important issue probably from our point of view, and I will take the opinion of all in a one the sentence each, that if, why multi-vessel, ignoring the results of the primary trial, the why everybody feels that multi-vessel PCI at the time of STEMI should not be done or why it is harmful. I'll start from uh, Anu and go everyone. Yeah, um, I think based on what has already been discussed, why it should be done and why it should not be done. Uh, once the culprit vessel is opened and we know patient is uh, stable and we have achieved the goal, which is, um, you know, patient has a good blood pressure, EKG uh, has come down, um, patient is chest pain free. Now we see an incidental another lesion. All depends, I think, what has been just discussed um, to say, should it be done, should not be done. If it is simple and you know you, you can do it within a couple of minutes, go ahead, fix it, versus something that is complex and you know you need multiple stents, uh, extra dye, um, I think you should think twice. We also know in this kind of uh, patients, patient who has been uh, unstable became stable just because you opened the culprit artery. You could make it, the patient again unstable trying to do um, so-called simple lesion. The so so therefore your lesion, point of view not to do the complex. second vessel is that is the patient, you can make a patient now relatively stable post-PCI in STEMI patient unstable by the second artery, yeah. right? That's basically the logic. Pedro? Yeah, you increase from 200 cc of dye to 300 cc of dye. You increase from 45 minutes to 67 minutes, the time of operation. And these patients are unstable. They can, they can be you know, hemodynamically fine, but they are going through an acute MI. I think opening the vessel is what, as Spencer started this conversation, is the objective of the acute MI. What is not allowed is to not do the other ones in the stage procedure. Because all these things that we have to prove ischemia and we have to, that this trial show that is not the way to go. This is the, the point. No, the, the trial is separate, but the question is, from your point of view, it should not be done because of the extra contrast volume, yeah. extra procedure time. And the objective is to open the artery. This is it in acute MI. The other vessels can wait, but cannot be <laughs> forgotten. Yes. So, uh, I thought it should not I, be done. I thought Pedro was uh, taking the other position, but uh, <laughs> 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 he's, he's, he's changed in midstream. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I, I'll think, explain my position. Let, let me, let me uh, first of all, uh, about this uh, door to balloon time. I agree that probably knocking 10 minutes off the door to balloon time is not going to do anything dramatic. But the increase in mortality, or the flat and uh, no decrease, uh, is probably due to the fact that you're doing tougher patients now. I don't think it's failure of the, re uh, the, the reperfusion or whatnot. The shocking thing to me about this trial is the outcome of the, of the control group, or whatever you call the group, where they didn't get other vessels done. They're, they're, they're really bad outcomes. I mean, you, don't have, you would be embarrassed to have these outcomes in this hospital, particularly with mostly inferior infarcts. I mean, so uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, concerning that uh, they, they did the, w with this protocol, did one vessel, left something behind. And so my view is that, uh, that uh, for patients who need another vessel done, you should do it. Uh, and, and what is that? It's, uh, it's not, uh, there's not a formula for it. It's not an average. It's some, something about uh, this. If you have an inferior infarct, uh, you have this uh, uh, maybe a trivial inferior infarct. I don't know. Maybe you knocked off the PDA, and you look, and this person's sitting there with a 90% proximal origin LAD, you know, uh, Timmy two and a half flow or something. I mean, of course, everybody would do that. I mean, the, the guidelines don't apply to everything. They're guidelines. So common sense would say absolutely you do it. On the other hand, to expand this to say you got a big fat anterior infarct, total LAD, you rush in there, you open the artery and you look and okay, they got two marginals, they got a, a, a distal right, you can start mucking around with all that. You've solved the, the immediate problem. The immediate problem is stop the heart attack and then, you know, these other things may not be as important. So I think individualization is, is, the, is the answer. So from your point of view, it is okay to do it? If it is a 90 plus percent lesion? My point of view, the one I described, I would do, yes. Okay. George, what will be the reason not to do it? The reason not to do it is well spoken by Anu. It's a lesion complexity, uh, a dye, and uh, radiation risks. If, uh, and also the guideline. It was class three. So it's not so easy to just go left and right and you no know, class three. But I must say that we have gone way overboard even including as a class three, a super proximal big LAD, exactly as uh, Dr. King described, that was still class three by interpretation of some people and was drawing a lot of criticism. So sometimes we were like, okay, this is crazy not to do it. At the same time, had even our fellows next to us say, you know what, that's class three, what are you doing? So I think to a certain degree, we had gone way overboard about questioning PCI. So we needed a study like this one to uh, normalize us. Okay, then I'll ask if I what do you think should be done or not done with your literature reading? Uh, I mean, as some of the other panelists alluded to, I mean, I think the context is everything. I mean, I think, as Dr. King pointed out, if there's a, a very severe prox LAD lesion that is not quote unquote culprit, I think most people would feel comfortable that um, perhaps intervening on that lesion may portend in the short term um, a benefit, especially if it's uh, uh, so, you know serving a, a large territory of myocardium that may or may not be jeopardized. So I think that um, again the context is everything, and if somebody doesn't get better with intervention of a, in a culprit artery, you need to search for alternative mechanisms and alternative lesions that may lead to clinical stabilization. But I. I don't think this is an instance where you know we should just open up everything as uh, has been alluded to. Javier, okay. yeah. I just have a question for the panel. Uh, do you think that the benefits in the trial would have been different with a staged uh, approach? Yeah, I think that will come back to that point. That will definitely be uh, the mm -hmm. question. But I think question for you and uh, Zai will be that uh, is there any negative of a non-culprit PCI? at the time of STEMI, that STEMI already have done the PCI, you're embolized, little myocardial stunning, some microvascular obstruction, and now you're working on the second vessel, and now you're creating, we know during PCI, the lot of distal embolization occurs, side branch closures do occur, microinfarct occurs almost in 30, 40% of cases, whether it's a distal apex uh, of the distal area or to the side branch and so. So could it be the another reason not to do is that why to create? Uh, unless it's a 
it's a less than TIMI 3 flow. So we are not talking about less than TIMI 3 flow in a vessel. It's a 90%, 70% lesion. As you know, in the trial, any lesion more than 50% felt to be suitable underwent stenting, underwent procedure. So that's a different story. But key is, and we are excluding the patients with a different vessel, with a uh, non-infarct related vessel with a TIMI, less than TIMI 3 flow. But the question is, it's a TIMI 3 flow uh, and 70, 80% lesion. The, that how uh, the, can we substantiate on this statement by opening this non-culprit vessel now. Uh, distal embolization, further microinfarction could be troublesome. I mean, I think, yeah. Samin, you answered your, your own question in a sense. I mean, you really, in, in terms of touching it, if you read, you know, and, and, and hear uh, Renu Vermani talk, you know, she, she really speaks about, you know, if you, you don't have to touch it, don't touch it, uh, because you are going to create, you know, some problems. So, so as an observer and reader of this, I will say, you know, try to be cautious and not, you know, conservative in the sense, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that hypothetically it would be very possible that when you are doing an angioplasty in a different vessel, you're damaging the myocardium yeah. of that vessel. And you know, with MRI studies, we have seen that in stable patients that you have microinfarct that you can see in the territory. Clearly, the trial doesn't show clinical harm. It shows mm -hmm. clinical benefits. So probably those are not consequential or those are not clinically important. But I would think that I would definitely like to see what is the potential mechanism why this strategy can be beneficial. Is it because it increases the contractility of the remote zone? What happens if you know that remote zone that is helping the infarcted area gets another infarct because you did an intervention in a vessel that you didn't need to? So I think those are the questions that I think would be very interesting to solve. But at the end of the day, the study was positive. So you cannot yeah. say that you know those theoretical infarcts that may have happened had a very strong clinical uh, impact on the patients. The clear, no, that's a very important point. And uh, the, before the study, the mindset of us as an interventionalist, and of course, that is just based on the various registry data, there was no randomized trial until this. There are actually two more trials ongoing at present. Uh, but until this was the first randomized trial, the mindset has, has been eluded that by doing the second vessel, non-culprit vessel, you may cause more hemodynamic instability, additional contrast, additional uh, rhythm disturbances, and microembolization. The contrary, in the trial, actually, when you did more than one vessel, you, of course, gave more dye. You have more fluoroscopy, uh, more x-ray exposure, more procedural time, yet it was beneficial. So therefore, what has been the total, you know, our usual notion uh, that uh, by adding uh, some complexity of the procedure may harm until it was put to the randomized trial basis, and that was exactly the primary trial was that rather than you wait for a severe ischemia and uh, just do it at the same time and feels that interventionists can do it. I mean, it's not that every patient uh, underwent with a multivessel disease. They have contraindication, left main or, or left main equivalent, not a total occlusion, very complex case. So those cases were not done. But it's a routine, easily fixed, non-culprit lesion, uh, rather than wait, because we have been waiting for the guidelines what to do with these those lesions. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the. ACC guidelines are very clear for the non-culprit vessel that perform the PCI during index hospitalization of the culprit vessel and the non-culprit you intervene during the hospital admission only if patients have unstable syndrome, otherwise you discharge. After patient discharge, the patient comes back for a stage intervention for ischemia or symptoms. So clearly, that, that routine which we, you need to do, we used to do in the past, uh, LEDMI, there is a 90% RCA. We used to schedule those patients routinely for a stage intervention. For, uh, when this fo focused update came last year, with the clear guidelines that routine PCI in these patients, even your significant lesion is not indicated, has to be guided by symptoms or by ischemia, we change our practice in our cath lab. Now, 
the clearly the with a lot of concern on on that issue uh, and uh, people don't want to wait uh, because of uh, <laughs> lesion you tell the family they have significant lesions many patients get overreact to it they come back to the emergency room early and try to get uh, lesion fixed but those are the you know various uh, Un, which you can't explain uh, various factors, but one the what clearly was shown in this study that if we have the strategy of not doing the PCI of the non-infarct artery unless patient has not only refractory pain but ischemia documented by non-invasive testing. So we went farther means really the maximum medical anti-ischemic therapy and ischemia and then only then patients underwent uh, PCI rather than routine stage intervention which is many people do and with some symptoms and we bring the patients back. So that point here is I think is a point of discussion now is that whether the strategy which seems to be shown superior in this study of do all vessels at the same time or just stage them rather than no, only do when there is a refractory ischemia to the highest level of failure of medical therapy and significant ischemia non-invasive testing. So uh, this, the second strategy, which is not tested, uh, is, will, be, will require a lot of discussion and that actually in the kind of a usual uh, practice in the United States. Ms. Spencer? You know, what we'd love to see in this trial is a mechanistic explanation for the outcomes. We would love to see, in fact, that uh, the lesions left behind that would have been randomized to be done caused the trouble. We don't know that. We have no information about what caused the trouble. We know there was trouble. Uh, I would rephrase it. Uh, that it's, it doesn't, it, this trial doesn't prove that, uh, uh, that immediate angioplasty uh, immediate stenting of multiple lesions uh, uh, improves things. I would say that uh, uh, leaving uh, critical, uh, leaving important lesions behind uh, may, and, and not uh, investigating them further, may uh, result in, in bad outcomes. Uh, that's, that's the way I would uh, look at this, because uh, we don't know, and, and we're in a place where there's an enormous interest in vulnerable plaque and, and ar arterial uh, uh, pathophysiology. What, one of the explanations the, uh, the authors of this uh, paper offer is that uh, you've got an acute uh, coronary syndrome. Uh, we know from other experience that there's sometimes uh, uh, other, quote, vulnerable situations in those patients. Uh, and uh, therefore, if you go ahead and interdict those things, you might help. Uh, now, what evidence do we have that the 50 to 70 to whatever percent lesion is the other vulnerable thing versus something else? So uh, did really stenting these uh, anatomic conditions uh, prevent an event, or did... Uh, somehow how leaving uh, uh, critical things behind uh, uh, create more events. I, I, I remain, I, my, my, and I'm willing also to say that a 400 patient trial uh, with, by the way, the, the uh, death, as you pointed out, doesn't quite make a significance mm -hmm. uh, and until you add in this thing about uh, uh, urgent revascularization and so forth. Which, by the way, is, is biased because it's not a secret that the patient had something left behind. Uh, th this is impossible to blind that information. The patient uh, is going to end up knowing they had something left behind. The doctor is going to know who reads the cath report is going to know they left something behind. So the patient presenting who does not have three or four stents in is going to be viewed as a different, perhaps, in terms of your interest in going ahead and repeating intervention than the patient who has a critical lesions left behind. So I think there is, there's, uh, and, the, and the author of the paper admitted that that is, you know, some limitation they couldn't get around. Um, but it is true that it's surprising mortality and infarct is much more 
even though the numbers are too small to, not, it's not underpowered, but uh, that is very interesting. So my conclusion is, I don't know, and I would like to see more trials yeah. on this subject, <laughs> but, you know, but with a staged uh, component. Uh, therefore, it, MI made it as well. So although the primary endpoint had the revascularization in, the combination of death or MI, that's um, very surprising. Combination of death or MI was significantly lower. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was very little stent thrombosis. That's another concern. Say, oh, you're going into AMI. Instead of putting one stent, you're putting three stents. Somehow, there was not much stent thrombosis, under 1%. Yeah in this study, which again, the safety points to the fact that probably they stented only very large vessels, because you go to small vessel, uh, you know, you have some stent thrombosis at some point of view. You know, when I was invited to this panel, I decided to review the literature carefully about this. And I went back to Carlo Di Merio's randomized trial published in 04, in which he did this. It was 69 patients, and the follow-up was one year. It was non-DES, it's HEPA code. The trial is called HELP IMI. Yeah. And what he found was in 69 patients randomized to multivessel PCI during acute MI or just called pre-lesion. He found that at one year, it was 35% maize in the single culprit lesion and 17% maize in the multivessel. So he, the p-value was not significant. He quoted the trial like it doesn't help. It was the p-value, even though it's double, because 69 patients. Then the group of uh, San Giorgi in Modena, uh, his first author is Politi, decided to do a nice randomized trial. And he, they, this group randomized patients with multivessel acute MI to culprit lesion only, culprit lesion with non-culprit lesion, like we're talking here, and the stage procedure for the other non-culprit lesions. They found that maize in the culprit lesion only was 50%. Uh, this trial was designed for follow-up at 2.5 years, not 12 months. Because 12 months, I learned that also. Risk stenosis comes in the first year, but for culprit, for native disease, you have to wait a little bit. That's what prospects show us. That you have to wait because the severe lesions and vulnerable plaques don't give you symptoms in the first 12 months. They give you in the second and third year. So these guys in Italy designed a 2.5 year follow up, and they found 50% maize in the culprit lesion only. 23% maize in the multiple vessels, same, same intervention, and 20% maize in the stage. Mortality, 15%, 9 and 6%. So they're showing us, and the relative risk was 67% reduction for the stage procedure. The stage procedure in that trial was the best. Why? Because, of course, we know from multiple, we know from autopsy studies, we know from atherectomy studies that these two did for the non-culprit lesion and the macrophages those days with atherectomy, you show that the non-culprit lesion had a lot of macrophages and lipid. And we know from OCT, data from IK Young and Mass General, that they have more macrophages, they're more... So intervening in non-culprit that are lipid rich, you may have trouble in the acute sense. You let the heal, let the, the, let the, my, the myocardial heal a little bit, bring the patient in a more stable procedure, and you have the best results. So I, I see that even though the trial is small, I'm sorry, take it too long, I can tell that for my patients, the stage is the best. And actually, uh, that exactly, precisely was uh, uh, the uh, paper from New York State uh, was that compared the three strategy, the multivessel in hemodynamically stable patients, PCI, at the same uh, time. Second, same hospitalization. <laughs> and third is uh, that stage intervention, which they counted up to 60 days. And actually, there was mortality reduced by p-value of 0 0.04. So a two-year follow-up decrease in mortality with the stage intervention. So therefore, that concept is there, which was, of course, uh, not tested. But now coming back to the point here, I think uh, it goes beyond just uh, putting a stent into the second vessel. We actually have done, well, everyone knows, that all so many trials uh, of uh, in a stable patients, multivessel uh, against medical therapy or so, courage trial being the classical, 
that did not show any significant difference. Of course, the post-MI has been a little different in the Swiss AMI and even asymptomatic patients that intervention may be superior compared to just wait alone, um, wait and watch. So then come back to the point that what really we think the benefit occurred in these patients by doing a multi-vessel intervention. So clearly now, I think after the discussion, everyone agrees. The which are with whatever way we interpreted the trial, that contrary to our usual practice, that culprit only and don't touch the non-culprit because of all the many factors of the dye, embolization, uh, arrhythmia, instability, and so that culprit, all vessels, if possible, fixing them is superior at two-year outcome with the clear in terms of the death and MI. We are not talking about refractory angina, really hard end point of death and MI. Then question comes now is what is the possible explanation or what are the possible explanations for this benefit? It cannot be just putting a stent because we know the stent alone do not prevent myocardial infarction. Even in uh, patients with a high risk, whether you have proximal LED, we have done a trials of the proximal LED, stent, medical therapy, and bypass. A stent didn't prevent myocardial infarction. So it, there has to be something more than just stenting in this study. So I think this is the, the next point of the discussion now has to be that let's assume the trial is positive. What do we think uh, from our point of view, or each of you point of view, that uh, one or two important region for this trial to be positive? We'll start from this side again, I know. The why trial is positive? Okay. Difficult to answer why. I mean, uh, I, all this has been uh, discussed already. Only one thing that I can think, we all know that uh, in the acute MI setting, there is some kind of uh, you know, systemic inflammation mm -hmm. in most of these uh, lesions. So I can understand if they had done that for more than 70 or 80 percent lesion, that um, at, the, at the same time some inflammation is going on, that they're giving all medical therapy and, at the, and taking care of uh, the lesion by uh, stenting, um, as well as you know, the vessel uh, remodeling. Or, uh, that happens um, after stenting, and more important is medical therapy, which is antiplatelet and uh, statin that they probably use. But uh, the way in uh, there was 65 percent reduction of the death in MI, and we know that uh, practice has been, uh, which we practice day to day. I mean, almost uh, 50 percent of patients, STEMI patients, have second vessel. Uh, and uh, we, is this the usual finding? Uh, we see, even if we don't do, because knowing that we categorically do not do multi-vessel PCI in the United States and clearly at uh, Mount Sinai. As I mentioned, I had done few out of United States, so largely because of the financial region and so, regions and, but here we don't do it. But is this not surprising what was noted that the event rate was so high? That if it you do not do the PCI of the non-culprit vessel? Event rate is, yeah, definitely high in the sense that, uh, I mean, so many uh, MI cases that we do, unless there is, a, you know, t less uh, TIMI flow is less than two, any other vessel lesion, I do not do at that uh, you know, setting at all. So 80%, 90% lesion, you leave alone, and um, they usually are asymptomatic until they come for a stage intervention. So that's why I, it's very difficult to explain why the event was that high when they left the patient alone, only because maybe they did not stage and waited for them to have some symptoms. You know, if, if you want to understand this field, read the paper of Goldstein in New England Journal in 2000 with the multiple complex plaques. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That paper tells you everything. You know, the repeat revascularization was 33% mm -hmm. in the com multiple complex plaques. Cabbage was up to, you know, 40%. Yeah. Why it is better? Because stenting is better than a 90% thrombotic non-culprit lesion. This is the risk. You open, a when you have multiple complex lesions, they give you trouble. But is that but the, the usual feeling, usual um, observation? No, no. I mean, Goldstein, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, used angiography to establish yeah, that these yeah. were yeah. Uh, multiple, uh, mm -hmm. vo uh, mul multiple culprit plaques. Now, uh, if you have multiple culprit plaques and you intentionally open some of them and not the others, it's not surprising you'd have trouble, I think. 
But uh, that's not uh, what is advertised in this study. I mean, they don't talk about angiographically culpable plaques. Maybe they were. Maybe that's one of the explanations why leaving all this stuff behind was dangerous uh, to the patient. But uh, uh, I think uh, there's a huge amount of evidence that staging things that need to be done is better than leaving the things behind. Uh, and the only argument I hear about not staging is somehow economic or somebody can't afford it or whatever. Uh, I hope that is, is not the case. If I was to have an infarct right here and had one thing and you stop my infarct and I'm fine, the question then is, okay, you say that there may be increased uh, inflammation, may be increased vulnerability of things. Do I really want those to be worked on right now or wait a few days or a couple of weeks and have it done when my myocardium is now recovered and I'm, I'm better? Uh, I would vote for a stage. Yeah, the interesting point is actually, although everybody talks about living uh, 80, 90 percent, whatever they left behind, whatever risk of death or MI did not occur over the next few months of the study. These curves were together until quite a few months afterwards, six months plus. So first of all, waiting to stage might have not really portend any real risk because even the waiting for a few months did not show in this study any difference. So perhaps indeed waiting for some time, this study actually shows it's okay. You just don't want to wait too long. And that's where it comes in. But ultimately, I, I'm also surprised by the high degree of death or MI in this study. And I think that somehow we have to come to the mindset of the British interventional cardiologist that nobody has rotablator, so that's out. Helvet cuts fat lesions are out. Bifurcations, they don't really treat with two stents. It's a single stent. They ignore the side branch all the time. They don't have even codes in the cath labs for distal vessels and uh, branches, diagonals, uh, uh, you know, AV marginals and all that. So really, these people had interventionalists who care about large myocardium at risk. And everything else was a minor detail in some kind of a report that nobody cares in that healthcare system, perhaps very appropriately, or perhaps we can talk about it. So in that mindset, that study was very successful. So those were the kind of patients and doctors that they were treated. If someone tries to you know, uh, repeat the same miracle by fixing a diagonal here and there, I think they're gonna be very surprised that they're probably causing more harm than, than good. And uh, you know, similarly, if someone comes in and says that courage was full of proximal LEDs, I was left alone to eternity, I would challenge that in that you know, people who are in our practice have a strongly positive stress test, uh, they're not even allowed to leave the hospital, not because the interventionalist is running after it, but because the stress laboratory and the clinical attendings are really referring them right away for a PCI because of their concern about their patients. So let's face that reality as well, that you know this uh, negative studies for PCI have been always confounded that patients with significant disease in major territories were never entered in these studies because nobody wants to even consider their patients to be in the control group. And that is really the reality of PCI studies in the United States. Uh, I, I like your solution. When in doubt, blame the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think then now we come to the very critical point uh, is this is a trial. We are the guidelines yeah. and the recommendation. Patient comes in, similar type in the United States. RCA total, LED 90%, TIMI 3 flaw. Do we do PCI of the RCA did good, LED? Can we do it and can we defend it just by this trial or did we have to wait for some, uh, the, our um, change in the guidelines? Spencer, what do you say? Uh, do, the, do the right uh, tonight at 4 a.m. whenever the patient came in uh, and keep the patient in the hospital a couple of days and if everything settled down, patient perfectly fine, do the LAD before they go home. I know. 
I would pick 80% LED, mid LED. <laughs> uh, if you are given the proximal LED and we know the patient is totally asymptomatic uh, for two days, um, I will stay with the patient after few I mean few, few weeks, which is usually five weeks time. Better. You know, you in the acute MI, you have hypercontractility of the non-culprit segments that is precluded when you have flow limiting. So the left ventriculogram plays a role here. If the anterior wall is hypokinetic, I will do it before the patient goes home. If the anterior wall is hyperkinetic, it's looking good, and the plaque doesn't look that ugly, I'll, I'll stage. Okay. George? Um, unless the patient is very unstable on uh, no, patient right is after PCI, if patient is happy after the uh, culpable vessel PCI, I'd wait the five weeks per the usual practice so far. And any from other uh, experts, <laughs> any recommendation? Any to the contrary? <laughs> so maybe, I, mean, I want to actually take the comment regarding to the mechanism, right? So the mechanistic aspect are very important. So paper by Narendoff and Swarovski from MGH, you know, basic science, uh, uh, basic study in animal models showing that after myocardial infarction, the pro-inflammatory macrophages are extremely present. So the whole aspect of trying to find the link uh, re related to inflammation and having a way to understand how can we actually treat this inflammation, that would actually be extremely helpful you know, to the field uh, you know, moving, moving forward. I'm very puzzled by the aspect of the, what is the stent doing to that lesion? Is it really making it less infl inflammatory? I'm not aware of anything like this. Maybe there was a selection bias in this patient. It was a little bit alluded to. Maybe some of these patients did have a character of a lesion that somehow was more amenable to these kind of aspects. So it's, it's, it's a lot of questions, obviously, that come, come to mind here. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the, some of the explanation uh, uh, could be, one, of course, uh, this increased uh, you know, hypercoagulation, yeah. the uh, widespread diffuse inflammation. But the question is, is the extent answer for that? It seems to be by the study, yes. But other logical explanation, which uh, uh, briefly uh, discussed by uh, Pedro Moreno, uh, one is that when you have infarct area, that there is the border zone. The recovery of the border zone is dependent on the blood supply whether it is also further compromised by the stenotic lesion of the non-infarct related. So yeah. one of the mechanism could be that by opening the non-infarct related that you have improved the overall that border zone area and uh, decrease the infarct size because now there is a, despite having some embolization, uh, we know that PCI may have microembolization, but uh, improving the blood flow to this, uh, to the area and decreasing the infarct size may be another explanation that why stenting uh, at, the, at uh, the time of STEMI was beneficial compared to just don't do anything or do it only when the symptoms are refractory. <laughs> so I think the, we'll open this uh, question, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, uh, for the audience here. But overall, just to sum it up, that at present, the guidelines are for multi-vessel PCI, and I here there is a split. It's still with two, actually uh, two and a half, I would say, because uh, one was in the, in, during the same admission. That is still we as an interventionist uh, do not do not want to change the practice, despite what was noted in the study. That the, just because of the way, uh, maybe it was just the first study of its kind, uh, very little uh, of the HEPACOT uh, HELP MI study by uh, in England, very small. But the key is that we probably will need to wait for the, uh, the trial results of other studies and, of course, more importantly, uh, change of the guidelines. But we still continue to, it will be fair to say, that continue to perform the PCI of the culprit vessel. But if we are very kind of uneasy because of the appearance of the second vessel, that maybe do a PCI during the same hospital admission on day three or five. Otherwise, the practice of staging, that is what we have been doing at present, will continue uh, till, until other, um, some other study comes up with different results. Now, if we have second study, 
says the same, comes up with a similar outcome, probably the statement may be different. Any from the panelists, any uh, one wants to make it any statement to the contrary or? I think the data from the state shows that if you do multi-vessel in the same acute MI setting, you increase mortality. This is published, you're the senior author, there was 0.9% in the culprit vessel only and 2.3% in the multi-vessel in the 30-day mortality. This is in hospital. But so, that is all in the uh, registry, yeah. Yeah, the registry, yeah. it's okay, but, but it tells us, it tells us that you know, if you, it's just you cannot jump all of a sudden to do three vessel PCI because the English people showed it. I, I had a lot of respect for the English, but it's, it's getting a little tough. Right? British, not all English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you, you, uh, you know, I, I very much uh, like uh, what's done in New York State with the registry. I congratulate you for still <laughs> putting up with that. But it is a registry, and you know the fact is not completely surprising that uh, patients you do multiple lesions in might end up doing worse because these might be the patients that you think you had to do multiple lesions. So selection. It's very hard to control for that. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, Doctor Fuster. I just we still think there is a selective. The question is, the results are true. What patients they selected, in my view, what they did, they selected patients in which the second lesion was very feasible and was very severe. Feasible and severe. And I think, I think that Pedro Moreno is completely correct. I think what you, what you do when you have a feasible lesion that is severe is you improve the collaterals to the infarct area. And that, to me, could explain why you have the number of deaths decrease significantly. So I think there's a very high selective patient. And I must tell you the following. If I have a patient that I sent to your cath lab and has an occluded RCA and has a 90% proximal LED, I would tell you to open the LED. I would tell you, I'm not talking about guidelines. I would tell you to open that LED thinking that that LED is critical to the counter artery. And I think that's what the patients were selected in the study, that they saw something feasible and severe, and then they randomized. When the patient was complex, like in the New York State, if you start pulling around, opening arteries that are bifurcations and so forth, then you end up with a great problem. So I think it's a, the study is a selective study in which everything is clean to exactly. be successful. Anyway, this is my view. No, I think that's uh, the point I uh, clearly felt, that by opening the multi-vessel, the biggest, one of the mechanistic region is just not just putting the stent. I don't think it's the stent answered it. I think the answer basically was that improve the collateral, decrease the border zone infarction, and decrease the infarct size. And because the flow was basically obstructed, yep. So I think the, you know, I, I mean, I really enjoyed everyone's uh, comments and I, uh, and I agree. And it seems to me that everyone has really, really uh, thought out the literature. But I think very important trial that is, that you didn't talk about, which I believe is the definitive trial in this is called the complete trial by Shamir Mehta, who is leading the trial in the McMaster University, will be 3,000 patients to be randomized with multivessel disease with at the time of STEMI to be randomized amongst 150 centers around the globe where they will be randomized to complete revascularization with staging. You basically do the culprit vessel and you stage versus ischemia guided. You do the culprit vessel and you send the patient out with an ischemia guided therapy, not with uh, you know leaving them alone and doing nothing to them. So I think very different than the way this approach was done. It was an all or not phenomenon here where you treated everything in a certain number of patients, selected patients versus doing nothing to those same patients, which I think what PRAMI pa uh, investigators did versus this study, which I think is a very well thought out, highly you know intellectual study with objective reasons and ways to be able to translate it. When we asked Dr. Wald, who are these patients that you actually included? What objective 
criteria did you have to include these patients? He couldn't tell us. Our, our uh, interventionists felt they can do that. He blamed the Brits, not us. Mm -hmm. so, it, so really, and, it, and, and frankly, it was a, it's a difficult study because it's not translatable. There were no objective criteria to say, here are the patients, a syntax score, FFR, something that we could hang our hat on to choose the patients to move on to do multivessel intervention. They failed to do that. And I think that's the biggest problem with that study. Yep. And, and also uh, the, there was no the second trial, the, the last trial complete, uh, which is our concept of the stage, uh, PCI, um, it will be the answer to the question because that is the routine practice, is not to just leave it alone, but plan it for the stage uh, intervention. Any other question from the audience? So it looks like that it's a field changing. Of course, um, uh, Dr. Fuchs mentioned that uh, maybe we'll change some uh, our practice pattern. At present, we do uh, do only culprit vessel, but uh, we will entertain anybody's suggestion and request uh, to do more than one vessel in a multi-vessel PCI. <laughs> but I think overall, I thank all the panelists and uh, Dr. Spencer King especially uh, for spending the day. And everybody, all of you to be here. Thank you.